come to order. This is the fourth day of the session, Friday, January 13th, 2023. Chief Clerk, please call the roll. Convening roll call for the fourth day, January 13th, 2023. Alamand? Present. Allred? Here. Andrew? Excused. Angelos? Here. Banks? Here. Bear? Here. Berger? Here. Brown? Here. Burkhart? Excused. Byron? Here. Chadwick? Here. Chestick? Here. Clauston? Here. Conrad? Here. Crago? Here. Davis? Here. Eklund? Here. Haroldson? Here. Harshman? Here. Heiner? Here. Henderson? Here. Hornock? Here. Jennings? Here. Knapp? Here. Larson Lloyd? Here. Larson JT? Here. Lolly? Locke, Present. Nyman, Here. Newsom, Here. Nicholas, Here. Nemec, Here. Northrop, excused, Oakley, Here. Obermuller, Here. O'Hearn, Here. Olson, Here. Ottman, Here. Pendergraft, Here. Penn, Here. Provenza, Here. Rodriguez Williams, Here. Sherwood, Here. Singh, Here. Slagle, Smith, Here. Stith, Here. Storer, Here. Strock, Here. Stivar, Here. Tarver, Here. Trujillo, Here. Walters, Here. Ward. Excuse, oh, she's there. Ward, Here. Washit, Here. Western, Here. Winter, Here. Wiley, Here. Yin, Zwanitzer Dan, Zwanitzer Dave. Speaker Summers. Here. Andrew. Excused. 59 present, three excused. So to help join me in uh, welcoming, welcoming back for the prayer of the day, Reverend Melinda Bobo of St. Andrews and the Pines Episcopal Church. Please rise. Let us pray. Lord, we are surrounded by the beauty and history and depth of this building. Help us to keep it always present in our minds as a reminder of why this gathering is here. It is here to make decisions on behalf of the people of Wyoming centered around truth, justice, courage, and hope. Lord, we ask that you bless this body with truth, not the truth that humans desire, but the truth that comes from you, the truth of what is, what was, and what shall be. Lord, bless us with your idea of justice, with a justice that provides for everyone, with a justice that is not skewed by things of this world, but sees clearly what is right, what is fair, and what is merciful. Lord, we ask you for courage, the courage to make those decisions that need to be made, not just on our own behalf, but on behalf of everyone, things that will benefit your entire body, your entire creation, your entire world, to let go of those things that strike fear and thus anger within us. Use your truth and your justice to see clearly those things that you would have us take up for our own and fight for them, for everyone. And Lord, bless us with hope 
for we know that only in hope will we move forward into your future rather than clinging to what we know hope gives us the power to step forward into what is unknown because we know that you are there waiting for us beckoning us onward to the new thing that you are doing in our presence Give us the hope of this season of Epiphany Tide, the hope of your light having come into the world, your light having come into everyone's lives, everyone's minds, everyone's hearts, and given them hope that we can live together in love. We can care for one another. We can do for each other. Not just pray, not just say, but dedicate our lives to the doing of your will and making real and embodying those gifts you have given us. Truth, justice, courage, hope, and love. Amen. Please join me in, in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
The House will please come back to order. Before she takes off, I uh, want to thank uh, Reverend Bobo for coming from from uh, my county, my hometown, and and being here. She had a rocky road on the road getting here, and I appreciate her coming. And I would I would just ask that we all rise and give her a little applause for coming. Privilege of the floor. I, I just want to tell you, this has been a wonderful blessing for me. And I've so enjoyed coming and being with you these days. And it was, it was worth going through all the torture to get to Rock Springs and then spending the night and then seeing if the road was open and, and having a dog that yelled at me the whole way. So <laughs> thank you very much. This has been an honor and a privilege. Thank, thank you. you. Journal Committee Report. Your Journal Committee reports that the Journal of January 12th, 2023 has been read and recommends that it be approved. Representatives Ward and Chestick. The Doctor of the Day is Dr. Christina Berenger. Is Dr. Berenger around? There she is. Let's give her a big welcome. And the, and the one thing I want to say, I don't know that we have a nurse of the day. Sometimes we do, but uh, I don't think we do today. The doctor of the day is a real deal, okay? It's nice to have him here. It's nice to applaud him. It's nice to applaud, frank, frankly, the medical profession. But really, you know, sometimes we get sick and ill and we're in here for a long period of time and we don't have, we don't have a doctor and, and she's available if you need, to, need something. So take, take that opportunity. If you feel really ill or, or something, let her know. You know, sometimes we hold it in, we think we can wait it out till we get home to a doctor, but, but uh, talk to her or whoever that person is, so. Um, and then just one other note, if you go home today, make sure you check in with LSO and get that down so you can get the reimbursal for mileage and stuff, so that's, before you take off, please do that. Um, now we got messages from the Senate. Message 100. Mr. Speaker, the Senate adopted the Committee of the Whole report failing the bill listed below by the vote indicated. Senate File 60, non-resident hunting license application fees. Eyes 10, noes 20, excused 1. The bill has been indefinitely postponed. Sincerely, Ellen Thompson, Senate Chief Clerk. We're at that order of business of introduction, reading, and reference of bills. The first bill for our consideration is House Bill 15. House Bill 15, sponsored by Judiciary. First reading of the bill. County authority to dissolve museum boards. Clarification. House Bill 15 is referred to committee number one, Judiciary. The next bill for our consideration is House Bill 96. House Bill 96, sponsored by Representative Crago. First reading of the bill. Transfer on death deed insurance coverage. House Bill 96 is referred to committee number one, Judiciary. The next bill for our consideration is House Bill 24. House Bill 24, sponsored by Capital Finance. First reading of the bill. State investments, compensation and relocation amendments. House Bill 24 is referred to committee number two appropriations. The next bill for our consideration is House Bill 46. House Bill 46, sponsored by Transportation. First reading of the bill. Wyoming Public Safety Communications System Trust Fund. House Bill 46 is referred to committee number two appropriations. The next bill for our consideration is House Bill 99. House Bill 99, sponsored by Revenue. First reading of the bill. Property tax refund program. House Bill 
number 99 is referred to committee number three revenue. The next bill for our consideration is House Bill 7. House Bill 7, sponsored by Representatives Wanitz or Dan. First reading of the bill. Underage marriage amendments. House Bill 7 is referred to committee number three revenue. The next bill for our consideration is House Bill 34. House Bill 34, sponsored by Education. First reading of the bill. School finance, mental health services. House Bill number 34 is referred to committee number four, Education. The next bill for our consideration is House Bill 35. House Bill 35, sponsored by Representative Heiner. First reading of the bill. Daycare certification requirements, amendments. House bill number 35 is referred to committee number four, education. The next bill for our consideration is House Bill 79. House Bill 79, sponsored by Representative Crago. First reading of the bill. Voter ID, concealed carry permit. House bill number 79 is referred to committee number five, agriculture. The next bill for our consideration is House Bill 95. House Bill 95, sponsored by Representative Rodriguez-Williams. First reading of the bill. Working Animal Protection Act. House Bill 95 is referred to committee number five, agriculture. The next bill for our consideration is House Bill 92. House Bill 92, sponsored by Travel. First reading of the bill. Wyoming Film Production Rebates Program. House Bill number 92 is referred to committee number six, travel. The next bill for our consideration is House Bill 84. House Bill 84, sponsored by Representative Summers. First reading of the bill. Regulation of commercially guided boats. House Bill number 84 is referred to committee number six, travel. The next bill for our consideration is House Bill 63. House Bill 63, sponsored by corporations. First reading of the bill. Vacancies in elected office. House Bill 63 is referred to committee number seven, corporation. The next bill for our consideration is House Bill 73. House Bill 73, sponsored by Representative Stivar. First reading of the bill. Annexation, vote requirement. House Bill 73 is referred to committee number seven, corporations. The next bill for our consideration is House Bill 59. House Bill 59, sponsored by Transportation. First reading of the bill. Wyoming National Guard tuition benefits. House Bill 59 is referred to committee number eight, Transportation. <clears throat> Excuse me. The next bill for our consideration is House Bill 57. House Bill 57, sponsored by Representative Brown. First reading of the bill. Armed Forces Amendments. House Bill 57 is referred to committee number eight, transportation. The next bill for our consideration is House Bill 43. House Bill 43, sponsored by transportation. First reading of the bill. Winter road closures. House Bill 43 is referred to committee number nine, minerals. The next bill for our consideration is House Bill 67. House Bill 67, sponsored by Representative Stivar. First reading of the bill. Special license plate decals, women veterans. House Bill 67 is referred to committee number nine minerals. The next bill for our consideration is House Bill 37. House Bill 37, sponsored by transportation. First reading of the bill. Telecommunicator, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. House Bill number 37 is referred to committee number 10 labor. The next bill for our consideration is House Bill 66. House Bill 66, sponsored by Representative Ward. First reading of the bill. Prohibiting mask, vaccine, and testing discrimination. House Bill 67 is referred to committee number 10, labor. Our, what? House Bill 66 is referred to committee number 10, labor. Thank you. All right, reports from standing committees. House Bill 36, sponsored by Transportation, Space Force Amendments, an act relating to Defense, Force, Defense Forces and Affairs. Mr. Speaker, your committee number eight, Transportation, Highway and Military Affairs, to whom was referred House Bill 36, Space Force Amendments, 
Respectful report, same back to the House with a recommendation that it do pass. Ayes, Representatives Berger, Brown, Nemec, Obermuller, O'Hearn, Pentagraft, Smith, Stivar, Wiley. Representative Brown, Chairman. House Bill 39, sponsored by Transportation, verifying the veteran's designation on Wyoming driver's license, an act relating to motor vehicles. Mr. Speaker, your committee number eight, Transportation, Highways, and Military Affairs, to whom is referred House Bill 39, verifying the veteran's designation on Wyoming driver's license, respectful report, same back to the House, with the recommendation that it do pass. Ayes, Representatives Berger, Brown, Nemec, Obermuller, O'Hearn, Pendergraft, Smith, Stivar, Wiley. Representative Brown, Chairman. House Bill 52, sponsored by Management Council. Revisers Bill, an act relating to the revision of statutes and other legislative enactments. Mr. Speaker, your committee number six, Travel, Recreation, Wildlife, and Cultural Resources, to whom is referred House Bill 52, Revisers Bill, respectfully report, same back to the House, with the recommendation that it do pass. Ayes, Representatives Angelos, Burkhart, Byron, Larson, Newsom, Singh, Storer, Western, Winter. Representative Newsom, Chairman. House Bill 11, sponsored by Judiciary, State Park, Rangers, Retirement, an act relating to retirement. Mr. Speaker, your committee number one, Judiciary, to whom is referred House Bill 11, State Park, Rangers, Retirement. Respectful report, same back to the House with the recommendation that it do pass. <clears throat> Ayes. Representatives Chestick, Crago, Haroldson, Jennings, Nemec, Oakley, Provenza, Rodriguez Williams, Washit. Representative Washit, Chairman. Re referrals, Chairman Washit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd ask that House Bill 11 be re referred to committee number two. Seeing no objection, House Bill 11 is re-referred to committee number two appropriations. Chairman Harshman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would ask that you re-refer House Bill 65988 suicide prevention to committee number two appropriations. Seeing no objection, House Bill 65 is re-referred to committee number two appropriations. Any other re-referrals? All right. We are at that order of business of bills on second reading. And so before I name it, you know, this is the first time you've all went into second reading and, and second reading is where we debate amendments and usually don't bait, debate the merits of the bills so much. And, uh, and remember, when you go into any reading, any reading other than Committee of the Whole, you only get to speak two times. So in second reading, you could speak two times on any one amendment. And after that, you're cut off. And obviously, as you guys have learned, if you divide that amendment, then you get two more times to speak on each division. So that's kind of the, the rules of the road. So the first bill for our consideration is House Bill 9. House Bill 9, sponsored by Judiciary. Juvenile Courts, Concurrent Jurisdiction Clarification, an act relating to juveniles. House Bill 9, having been read two separate times, the question is, shall the bill be read a third time? Hearing no objection, it is so ordered. The next bill for our consideration is House Bill 13. House Bill 13, sponsored by Judiciary. Office of Guardian Ad Litem, Program References, an act relating to children. House Bill 13, having been read two separate times, the question is, shall the bill be read a third time? Hearing no objection, it is so ordered. The next bill for our consideration is House Bill 28. House Bill 28, sponsored by Education, Community College Capital Construction, an act relating to the duties of the Wyoming Community College Commission. House Bill 28, having been read two separate times, the question is, shall the bill be read a third time? Hearing no objection, it is so ordered. Mr. Majority Floor Leader. Mr. Speaker, I move that the committee, that the House resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole. 
All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. Representative Byron. Hey! Good job. Thank you. Committee of the Whole, will you please come to order? The first bill for our consideration is House Bill 17. House Bill 17, sponsored by Agriculture. State lands, grazing of non-owned livestock, an act relating to state lands. Mr. Speaker, your committee number five, Agriculture, State and Public Lands and Water Resources, to whom was referred House Bill 17, State Lands Grazing of Non-Owned Livestock. Respectful report, same back to the House, with the recommendation that it do pass with the following amendments. Ayes, Representatives Alaman, Allred, Banks, Conrad, Crago, Davis, Eklund, Slagle, Winter. Representative Eklund, Chairman. You have heard the reading of the bill. What is your pleasure? Mr. Chairman, um, I move that when the Committee of the Whole rises to report, it do so with the recommendation that House Bill 17 do pass. And I, there, there's an amendment. I'd further move that amendment. You've got, folks, you've got it on your screens. There are actually two. And one of them is a standing kid, committee amendment. Am I on the right one? Yes, I am. Um, there are two amendments, and the Standing Committee Amendment was, um, I'll ex I'd like to, to move that amendment and have the, the Committee of the Whole vote on it, and then it'll be worked into the bill as we, as we do it. There's only one, one amendment. I'm mixed up. I've got two bills piled here um, but I, I would move that amendment and and ask for the body to vote for it it fits into the bill and most of it is technical change and then our floor manager will uh, will explain explain that as he goes thank you you have heard the motion on the standing committee amendment are you ready for the question question, question haven't been called all those in favor, aye. Opposed, no. Aye. All those in, uh, all those opposed, no. Stand me, standing committee amendment passes. We're back on the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll turn the floor management of this bill over to. Representative Crago. Representative Crago. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I bring to you House Bill 17 and ask you for your favorable consideration. House Bill 17 is an Ag Committee bill that was worked throughout the interim, and it serves as an attempt to provide statutory direction to our Office of State Lands. Specifically, the bill deals with grazing leases and how the Office of State Lands defines them and classifies them. Under current law, anytime a state land grazing lessee subleases state lands for grazing, the lessee has to pay one half of the profit on the subleases to the state as a surcharge. And you'll see that in the language of the bill that we've brought to you. However, the question has arisen as to what actually constitutes a sublease. And there's a lot of disagreement around the state because of the current statutory language, or in this case, really the lack thereof. And the, the bill simply provides a more de definitive statement on what we believe the law should be. 
Most producers in the state understand that a sublease is defined as when the lessee gives up control of the grazing decisions and management decisions. However, when a producer runs cattle for another person, for example, with their own cattle and charges a fee, but yet maintains control over those cattle, the grazing and management decisions, this is typically within the industry not considered a sublease. And so if you look at the language and couple it with the amendment that we've already adopted, if you look at the language of the bill and the amendment, it, it simply clarifies that running cattle for another person is not a sublease, so long as the state land lessee maintains full management responsibility. And thus there would be no surcharge applicable and no requirement to get permission from the Office of State Lands before doing so. And that's pretty much the, the skinny on it. Uh, I stand for any questions that the body may have. Representative Henderson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have a question as to what the, to help us understand what the discussion was in the committee regarding the rationale for, for not requiring uh, state lands agency to weigh in when there's, uh, you know, a change in the lease, to, you know, basically the change. It says shall not, I believe. If you could help me with that, I'd appreciate it. Representative Crago. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think the, essentially the reason we're not asking state lands through this bill to weigh in is because there is not a change in the lease. We're not changing the amount of cattle that are being grazed. We're not changing the AUMs. The state lands office has a set amount that's charged for every state lease throughout, throughout Wyoming, and it's based on an AUM. We're not changing that amount. What this bill says is if you have, for example, 100 AUMs and you run 80 of your own cattle, you could run 20 of someone else's. And, that, and as long as you're maintaining control over those, often it's, it's in a share, share lease agreement circumstances usually where this comes up. If you actually are subleasing the land to someone else and that someone else has control over the, the grazing, the management of the cattle, et cetera, for example, if you're if the family ranch, family decides that oh, we don't, you know, we're getting too old to do this, we don't want to do it anymore, or more likely, we can't make any money doing this, uh, and they decide to lease it to someone else and walk away from the ranch, that will still be considered a sublease. And then that will be subject to the surcharge within the statute. Representative Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and to the good bringer of the bill, I you're, you're starting to touch a little bit on some questions that I had as I read that and would just like a little more clarification on retaining full management responsibility component of that. And in, in light of the example you kind of had, if I had 20 head of my cows running with, with yours, am I, is it then a violation of your state land agreement if I'm there helping you work those cows or you know, how does this get into the, how, how does full management defined and responsibility, if you can walk me through that a little bit. Representative Crago. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think the easiest way to look at that is, th the short answer is no, you can still come and help um, with your own cattle if someone else is running them. Where it becomes a problem is if you're, you were telling the state land lessee on what day to move those cows, where to move those cows, uh, how, to, how to actually run his operation. That's different than being there and assisting because th at that point, the state land lessee is still maintaining the control of how those cattle are grazed, where those cattle are, where those cattle are grazed, and making sure that we're managing that asset appropriately. Thank you. Representative Western, no? Question. Question being called. All those in favor of, I lost my spot, hold on a moment.
All those in favor of Representative Eklund's motion that the Committee of the Whole rises to report, it do so with the rec recommendation that House Bill number 17 do so pass, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. House Bill 17 has passed the Committee of the Whole. The next bill for our consideration is House Bill number 29. House Bill 29, sponsored by Education, Community College Funding, Distance Education Credit Hours, an act relating to community college funding. Mr. Speaker, your committee number four, Education, to whom is referred House Bill 29, Community College Funding, Distance Education Credit Hours, Respect for report, same back to the House with the recommendation that it do pass. Ayes, Representatives Allred, Andrew, Berger, Brown, Clauston, Lawley, Northrop, Obermuller, Provenza. Representative Northrop, Chairman. You have heard the reading of the bill. What is your pleasure? Uh, Vice Chair Obermuller. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I move that when the Committee of the Whole rises to report, it does so with the recommendation that Bill Number 29 do pass. And for the explanation of the bill, I turn it to our esteemed colleague from District 9. Thank you. Representative Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't know that I've ever been called esteemed, so I appreciate that. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I bring to you House Bill 29, and ladies and gentlemen, this is a fairly simple bill. Um, again, this one was one of those ones worked by uh, the Education Committee through the interim process, and what this bill does is kind of levels the playing field um, for distance education learners at community colleges. And ultimately what we're trying to do here is make sure that uh, community colleges that offer distance education are reimbursed and or given the same credit for the uh, types of classes that they offer to the students in a distance education setting as they would for those that are gonna be on campus. And so uh, what we found is the current statute allows for a multiplier of, not to get into the weeds too deep, but a 0.8 that we thought at the time was uh, an acceptable rate for reimbursement to these colleges to say if a student receives something from a distance education um, setting, they're going to be paid at basically 80% of what we would normally pay somebody who is sitting on uh, in a classroom on the on the campus. Through the past couple of years, what these uh, education facilities have noticed is it's actually just as, as expensive, if not more expensive, to provide these same level of services in these distance education settings. And so all this bill is attempting to do is if you go to page two and you look at line eight, it says, as determined by the content of the course. And a lot of people would look at that and go, what in the world does that mean? Well, the difference on this is that we have three different levels of courses. And what those levels of courses are is level one is a lecture. So you're sitting in your, your group, you have the same group of people um, sitting there throughout the semester. It's more or less just being lectured to. A level two is a lecture lab. So you think of this, this would be something like biology, chemistry, something those that they have to have some sort of a lab or some sort of a, an in-person setting that's gonna be a little bit more intense. And then of course, level three, we actually have high costs and low enrollment areas. So think of this as your CTE courses where they're gonna have very impactful areas um, that they're gonna have to have intensive um, information and intensive uh, tools and stuff like that sitting at these distance education facilities. So those level one, two, and threes, all we're looking at doing is making sure that when those students are enrolled at these distance education facilities that the community colleges are funded appropriately for these. So at a level one, they would be funded at a 1.0, which is exactly what they would be normally uh, assisted with. At a level two, they would be funded at a 1.25. And at a level three, they would be funded at a 1.5. And so that's the same exact methodology that we use with community colleges when they're receiving that information at the campus, we're just looking to make sure that we uh, approve that same level of funding to those that are receiving uh, these types of services uh, across the state, and we have plenty of them. So uh, another question that was raised during committee is, well, why would we do this? Well, currently what this actually does is it provides a disincentive for community colleges to actually provide these types of college courses to distance education learners, and we definitely don't wanna be doing that. Why, does, why would you say it disincentivizes? Well, it's only paying 80% of the same funding that we would be doing elsewhere. 
And so what we're trying to do is level that playing field and make sure that community colleges have that opportunity to fund at a full course um, the costs that are going to be incurred instead of them having to dig into their pockets elsewhere to fund these distance education courses. So uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll stand for any questions. Thank you. Representative Stith. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. So my question for the good representative from District 9 is this. This bill seems to be about money, right? And that's why they're bringing it, because right now they, for, a dist for an online class, they get 80% of the money that they would get for, say, an English lecture. English lecture, you know, for Shakespeare, it's going to be level one, right? Why is that level? Teaching English is probably a level one because you don't have a lot of lab equipment for that, right? Just as the good representative explained. My question is, intuitively, it seems that online classes should be cheaper to provide because you don't have to have a classroom. It, you should be able to provide the class to an unlimited number of people, more people. You don't, you're not limited by class size. Uh, so get me over the, the, my, my barrier here. Uh, I'm just, I need help understanding why this is a good idea. And specifically, this seems to allow the commission to just say, we're going to treat an online class as though we're, we're welding. Because if you can do a level one, level two, level three, can you give me an example of when an online course would ever be like welding, a level three, which is funded, I think, at you know, essentially 200% of the funding level. So this bill's about money. It just seems to me that online should be more efficient. And so the question is, why is online education offered by the community colleges apparently that inefficient? Thank you. Representative. Henderson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a quick question on page two, line 10, the repealer. Uh, what are we repealing, repealing and why, please? Representative Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good question, and I, I forgot to mention the repealer. The repealer is simply just the 0.08, or I'm sorry, the 0.8 uh, methodology that we apply to the current statute. And so when we're looking at that, that's just simply removing that from statute. And then what we're doing is we're adding that uh, language that I mentioned on page two, line eight, as, as determined by the course of, or the content of the course. Uh, to the good representative from the uh, center part of our state here, uh, the center south porter portion of the state is, why is this less efficient? right or why is it not more efficient and the simple justification is is let's let's take welding let's think of welding well the the law requires that if we have a student who wants to receive welding we have to provide the same level of services to that student who is going to be potentially in right wyoming uh, that we would be doing to the same student that would be receiving that at Eastern Wyoming Community College. Well, the difference is, is Eastern Wyoming Community College now has to go and actually bring up all the supplies, all the equipment, and make sure that they've got everything at this one location for this one student in Wright, Wyoming. But that could also be at seven other locations throughout the state. And so we have a situation in which we have kind of an inopportune situation where these community colleges are attempting to offer these courses to students throughout the state but it's actually costing them more to put the uh, education services on than what they're actually receiving back in benefit. So we're just looking at that. And to, to the good um, question that was brought on that, uh, a welding is a 1.5. And it's the same um, at the location here. You know, If you were go to LCCC or whatever the case may be, um, it's going to be 1.5 here. And it's, we're not asking for more money than what they're asking for at these other locations. They're just asking for a level playing field. Because when we have a student that wants to take that course, they have to be provided that exact same level of uh, course aptitude that they would get here as they would anywhere else across the state. Representative Stith, you want to take it? Representative Washup. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just from my perspective, the courses that I teach online, we are capped. We don't have an unlimited number of students that can be in those classes. We keep that number fixed uh, at 23 at my institution, and I believe that's true at all the districts, um, so that we have a quality of educational experience for those students who take those classes. When I teach a live class, I may have an amphitheater with 40, 50 students in it. And so it's, it's in fact more efficient for me to be in that live classroom with 50 students in it than it is to be in the online classroom where I only have 23. 
the fixed costs in terms of, of faculty uh, are the same, whether you have 50 students in the class or 23. And so sometimes the efficiency goes to the live classroom more so than to the virtual classroom. Representative Stith. Mr. Chairman, back to the, the, appreciate the comments from the representative from District 9. Um, I guess I have a question. For online courses, are there any laboratory-like courses or welding type courses that are actually taught online is my first question because my, my understanding is that they're not, that you don't do diesel tech, diesel mechanics online. Perhaps they do. I'd be interested in knowing that if they, if they did. And, and the second is to the point that I don't think the community colleges are required to, you know, they're, they're allowed to have disparate educational opportunities. Like you can have nursing taught at one community college. It's, it's, it's not required that nursing be offered say at a different community college there's not this requirement as there may be in k-12 representative brown thank you mr chairman uh two great questions um first and foremost i want to make sure that we uh are, are clarifying this this idea that they're all online that's that's not what we're talking about it's not online courses it's what we would consider distance education courses and so distance education means that you're being able to be provided the same level of service for a course anywhere else. They may not be online, but they're going to be taught the same course somewhere else across the state that they're offering here. And then the second question is, you're absolutely right that not every location is required to teach certain things and they have that opportunity. But this is trying to level that playing field and allow these community colleges to provide that education that they're otherwise not able to provide to students across the state right now because it costs them more to put on that education at a 0.8 uh, reimbursement than it would if we just provided the same level of reimbursement to them for, to teach that lecture to the student um, you know again in right wyoming versus sitting in the classroom in, in cheyenne wyoming so it, it's it, as the good uh, representative from the center part of the state mentioned it there's in certain cases that it could be more beneficial to actually be teaching in person um, and that efficiency has grown there as opposed to online but it's not just online courses either and then one of the other things that was also brought up during committee uh, discussion as well and especially even during the interim work is sometimes certain courses are required that they may not be able to find an individual that's qualified to teach that particular course and so they actually end up having to go out and contract and, and have a certain contractor that would be able to afford this well then they contract that out but they're only being provided 80 percent of that contract work back in so there, there's some other stuff that happens along the way when you when you start talking about only providing 80 percent of the same services that you're going to be providing to this student that you wouldn't be providing if this student was sitting in classroom so uh, again just leveling the playing field with our community college students representative penn thank you chairman um so as a matter of clarification and question, I assume, and, and you kind of alluded to it a little bit, um, going back to the subject of, of providing welding classes online. So my husband is a welding instructor. And um, so knowing the difficulty of, of trying to offer those services, I mean, you, you, can't, you can't offer welding online, but it sounds like it's more of a distance, you're saying distance. So are you saying that um, the classroom Say you have an, a, an instructor at CWC who's, who's the distance is at another community college and they're teaching at that via Zoom or something like that. That's what you're saying. And so are you also saying that if this other facility doesn't have what is necessary for this instructor to teach, then, then, this, then at some point there's a requirement that they have to equivalent or, you know, make the machinery or, or those types of things equivalent or or how does that work because um welding equipment is extremely expensive and so to to then say that all of the community it seems like this would create a situation where all of the community colleges would be required to have the same equipment can you speak to that representative brown well thank you mr chairman again um so the, the, again, I wanna make sure that it's clear that we're not talking strictly only online. There is the distance education portion and uh, distance education does not necessarily mean that these uh, students are gonna be taught at another community college. These can be at distance education centers across the state. So 
Uh, for instance, if you have, if you, if you're in Jackson, uh, you may be able to take a welding course. And what may happen is they may have somebody who is a certified welding, uh, you know, instructor up in Jackson that would come in and proctor the information and say, "Hey, look, yes, this looks good," and they would report back to the teacher who's teaching from Laramie County Community College. So it's not necessarily that there's. Um, not somebody there all the time or that they're going to be look they're not able to look at the welding or uh, think of nursing is another one that's that's a, a very common uh, application for this process as well um, these are the types of issues that you're going to see when you don't have the availability of having all of the um, teachers and all of the other staff that may be around in a smaller community um, to, to teach this particular course. They're going to have that availability to come in and proctor those types of uh, exams and, and look at the quality of work and stuff like that. So um, I think that's what you're trying to get at. And then to the question of about, you know, equitability is do they have to have the same information in the same, uh, you know, if it's a welder, do they have to have that same welder in Jackson as they do in Cheyenne? And the answer is yes, they have to provide that same level of outcome um, opportunity for every student that's going to be taking the course, regardless if it's being taught on campus or distance education and that's why we're bringing this bill is if they have to provide that same level of service to that student in Jackson they're only getting paid 80 percent of the reimbursement on that as they would if somebody was here sitting in the in the seat in Cheyenne doing the same work thank you representative Penn may I follow up please chairman <clears throat> um, so a couple of questions when you're saying that they're funded at one so a um, welding class would be funded at 1.5 is that 1.5 percent of something or what it, what are we talking about when we're saying 0.8 or 1 or 1.25 or 1.5 representative brown thank you and, and great question I, I appreciate that question um what that is is that's the community college uh, tuition rate that's set by the community college so uh, it, it, use simple numbers. If it's $100 a credit hour, that 1.5 would be provided at $150 uh, for a heavier, uh, you know, heavier lift for that particular class that requires, um, you know, labs or uh, certain equipment or whatever the case may be. So that's what that 1.5 is versus the 1.0 and the 1.25. Um, it's the it's the amount of effort and the amount of uh, equipment that would go into providing the the level of that particular class. Thank you, Representative Davis. Mr. Speaker, uh, speaking on behalf of the bill, we have an outreach program in our community and uh, it's very beneficial to the students there. They don't have the mileage to deal with, but the cost to the outreach program is the staffing of the facility, the equipment in the facility, the utilities of the facility, and the building there that houses all this. So I think it'd be very relevant to level the playing field. Thank you. Representative wanted, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have some questions on the admin and fiscal impacts of the bill. So we're talking about as determined by the content of the course. And so I guess my questions are who determines that content and to make sure we don't have one community college saying this is a two and another saying, well, it's a three in our case. And if that's correct, that we're going to standardize every course at a certain level, it would be my understanding that that's a couple of thousand courses, perhaps, depending on what's offered as distance ed. It might be a couple of hundred, but isn't there some type of administrative impact to the Community College Commission to go through every course now and get information to decide what the cost is of that delivery? And won't that take um, another more people, more time, more effort? It seems very simple in a couple of word change, but I have to imagine this is a significant overhaul of how we fund our colleges. And I don't think anyone's going below 0.8, so that'll be a significant increase um, intuition and price, et cetera, here in a couple of years when we're paying perhaps double for some of these courses. Would that be correct? Representative Rodriguez Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I draw attention to the, the fiscal note as well, uh, the concern of it being indeterminable. Um, my question to the bringer of the bill is, uh, will it bring in-person costs down? Thank you, Representative Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so both uh, simple questions as far as how you would look at this. Um, to be honest with you, that if you look at the fact that the fiscal uh, impact is indeterminable, um, 
really what that boils down to is there's a lot of these different courses that come in and come out um, every single semester and how they how they adjust these. So not having the understanding of how many courses are taught right now versus what's going to be taught next year is where the ultimate issue comes in. But then that being said about whether or not uh, who determines what this is, the commission sets those. And again, the, this 1.0, 1.25, and 1.5, those are all set by the commission by rules and regulations. And so we do have a standardization for these types of courses. These are put into the case uh, when a course comes online. Uh, when these are taught in the, in the community college setting on campus, they put this out and if it's a lab and it requires something, they're re, uh, refunded back or they're provided the level funding for every student at that 1.25 or 1.5. So this is just leveling that playing field yet again for those students that are going to be in those outreach programs, not online only, outreach programs that are gonna be across the state. And so that standardization does occur and there is a standard uh, set by the commission and that's why this is overseen already. This is just trying to make sure that the people who are gonna be taking these courses um, are provided the same level of opportunity that those would be here, you know, again teaching, uh, being taught inside the, the community college classroom on campus as opposed to distance education. Thank you, Representative o Obermuller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to roll back to the, uh, the lecture course question, uh, why that shouldn't be cheaper. And the issue there is that the remote learners are full students like the ones on campus and they are, then they have access to all of what the campus has to offer, including uh, connection to the instructors themselves, including advisory services, including library services, including administrative services in terms of their, them being a student. So they are a student just like anyone else. The costs incurred associated with those students is the same as the ones that are on campus. Thank you. Representative Ottman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just for a point of clarification, um, with the increased amounts of what these classes then would be reimbursed, I was wondering where the reimbursement come, will come from. Will it be um, a raise in tuition? Will it be a raise in the needs in the budget? Will it be um, a reallocation of funds differently? How's that gonna be handled? Thank you. Representative Nichols. <clears throat> Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, I, I too have some questions about this particular bill. Um, so when, when, when they tell you that the impact is undeterminable, what we know is it's gonna cost a lot of money, a lot more money. So I, what I always wanna know as an, as an appropriate is, well, let's figure out how we can get a rough calculation of how much this is gonna cost. And to do that, you look at all the courses that are offered through our community colleges or wherever, how many of them are online or how, how of them are, are long distance, um, how, do, how many of them are, are lectures or, you know, level one, level two, level three, and then you do the, a math calculation. And then you can find out how much is this going to cost. That's number one. And then when the colleges come in and ask for this, I want to say, show me your bookkeeping. Show me how this actually does cost up to one one-on-one -on -one cost. Prove it to me. I mean, it's, it's the show me concept. And, and, and I'm just, you know, I, I'm, I'm similar to the good representative from the southwest part of the state. I don't mind the idea if it's accurate, but before I do it, I want to see the numbers. I want to understand how you come to this, to this conclusion. The way I read the definition of long distance education is these could be tape recorded classes. And so every time you play the tape recording over again, you get um, one full credit dollar for, for replaying it. Uh, and so I'm just going, I just think the definition needs to be better understood. How much is it gonna cost? If, if one third of all our classes are offered in this kind of a mechanism, you know, th this could cost a hundred million dollars, literally, uh, out of our pockets that we have to then appropriate. And wait, it's a, look at what the community college budget is right now. Um, biennially, it's about 450 million. Um, and if you increase, I don't know how many classes are offering. What's the data? Where have the, what, where's the information to give us so we can make educated decisions based upon on, on the facts? Thank you, Representative Penn. 
Thank you, Chairman. Um, in reference back to the good representative whose location I don't know, um, uh, discussing increasing the level ones in the classrooms from 0.8 to one in, and um, saying that, you know, those students may still have access to the other resources available at the, uh, at the uh, community college. Um, do we have any rates or statistics on what that rate that actually is? Because personally, I know I've taken a lot of online classes myself, and the reason that I take them is because I either have difficulty getting to the campus or I don't want to, and I only need this class for one thing. And so I'm not, I'm really not taking in very many of the resources except for things related specifically to that class. And so I'm just wondering if there's any, um, if, if we know of a rate of use of these um, online students as far as them accessing those other services. Thank you, Representative Provenza. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just wanna kind of clarify what it looks like to teach online. I've taught courses online, I've taught them on campus, and I've taught them where they started on campus and then where they ended online. Um, it is considerably even more work to teach an online class given that it's not just a cookie cutter. I can record it and hand it over to you and you can do all the work and I can have unlimited people take it. I'm still grading papers. I'm still having meetings with students, maybe even more meetings because they aren't in the classroom with me so they can't come talk to me afterwards. Um, I have to, I record my lectures, but they have to be updated. It's not like I can deliver a lecture in 2019 and give the same one. It's considerably more work and no one's happier taking a class online. Um, I think as we all have learned that online life is just not learning in the classroom or being in real life. Um, it can be expensive for those reasons. So it, even just taking away from those costs. The other thing we heard during testimony was that um, sometimes we're having to contract out because we aren't able to get folks here to do it. That contracting out might end up having to cost the school more. So they're just walking away bleeding money um, because we aren't able to kind of give them the wiggle room to do what they need to do. So while I would love to believe that online education is quick and easy and doesn't take much work, it is far from the truth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, if the bringer of the bill could help me kind of understand, then if we if we raise that, it's going to be there will be a fiscal impact, and my understanding that that's undetermined. But I'm just wondering what the consideration was during the the conversation. Is that is that fiscal impact then assumed that we would require the participants online or at a distant learning to to pay any increased fee, or um, is it anticipated that that would come from an appropriation? How, or is that determined from situation to situation? If they could just help me understand what that conversation was and how they was going to cover that that increase, or the colleges anticipated doing that. Representative Brown. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I feel like I have done more talking today than I have all last year uh, on one bill. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, um, so I, I want to be clear here. What we're doing is we're not actually adjusting any of the money that's coming into this. This is actually just a change in the funding formula, right? So our good, our good chairman from appropriations can rest easy at night knowing that he can still restrict the amount of money that he gives to the Community College Commission. He can still make sure that he has those reins tightened in and those appropriators can still make sure that their money is be spending appropriately. What we're doing here is we're saying that we're going to make sure that the community colleges that are offering distance education process or programs are getting the same funding to the students that are receiving these elsewhere throughout the state that they are when they are attending in a local area that has the community college, you know, if they were sitting in that same classroom. 
the, the idea that we're going to run this up and we're going to have a state deficit because we took care of our kids and or those distance education learners and that we're gonna go bankrupt because we're going from a 0.8 to a 1.0 or a 1.25 is not something that I would be losing sleep over tonight personally. I understand that there's a concern that we may see a little bit of an uptick, but frankly, ladies and gentlemen, what we saw during COVID was more students taking advantage of our community colleges than ever before number one, and number two, more adults taking community college courses throughout the state distance education because they cannot afford to travel the way that they do. So this particular situation was brought to your committee number four, your education committee during the entire interim where we were heard hours and hours of testimony. This is not a fly-by-night bill that I personally brought up and said, hey, I'd like, I'd like to just give some more money to the community colleges. This was something that we heard over two different meetings and we voted on on a third meeting. We have the information. That information is readily and publicly available. You can go back to, and I pulled it up here. Uh, the last time that we heard about this was on September, September 9th of, uh, or I'm sorry, September 6th of 2022 up in Casper. We heard about this for about an hour and a half. We got a good layer of information here and all that information is available to you to go back and look at as well. If, you, if you're untrusting of the, the committee work that was done. That's where we actually do this hard, hard and heavy lifting. So I appreciate the questions, but ultimately what we have been asked is by the Community College Commission to take a look at this and say, hey, look, we've had an increase in students utilizing these services. It's impacting our ability to provide these services to these students. We'd like to level the playing field to make sure that we can still provide these opportunities to everybody who is interested in doing them throughout the state. And that's really what we're doing. So the appropriators can rest easy tonight. If we pass this bill out of committee of the whole, we can rest easy at night knowing that we're taking care of those students that are interested in taking welding or nursing or any of these heavy hitting courses across the state. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Larson. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I, don't think, I don't think anybody is trying to question what the committee is doing. I think what we're trying to do is understand the intent of the bill and the impacts of the bill and just trying to get a, better understanding of the mechanics that it will do. And so when you say it's going to be put something on a similar playing field by increasing the reimbursement, we're simply just asking, okay, so then that's going to be an additional financial requirement to the colleges based on those distant learning individuals. So we're not trying to we're just trying to understand so we can make a good vote. And, and so we're just trying to understand, was it contemplated or discussed in the committee if we've seen a significant uptick in distant learning, as well as maintaining their level on campus population, it would require additional funds. Would you anticipate that that would come from a request for appropriations or did they suggest that maybe they would increase tuition fees for distant learning that's all we're trying to understand here and would certainly be appreciated as we prepare to make our vote thank you representative brown thank you mr chairman to the good vice chair i i absolutely agree uh, that, and and frankly to the to the new members of this chamber this this is exactly what we do in committee of the whole right we ask the questions we dive deep into these bills and uh, you know, what, what I assume to be a fairly simple bill um, has, has taken us better part of a half hour to debate and, and make sure that we understand completely. And that's what we're doing here. So um, I went back and I tried to pull up as quickly as I can here to have some of the information from that September meeting. And as I'm looking here, um, what the differences that we're looking at and what they would be requesting for funding ranges anywhere between um, 7 million and $13 million uh, across the entire state that we would see as a, an increase in, in costs. Um, that is an estimate. That's, that's going off of all of the eight community colleges that represent your community college districts and the, the students that you have in your areas. Um, and and that's, that's a rough estimate based off of the amount of students that they've seen with the uptick over the past couple of years, again, with COVID and the amount of people coming back to college. So um, that's a rough estimate. And, you know, it looks like I've got a few more questions. So while those questions are being asked, I'll try to read as well as listen at the same time and try to answer more of these questions as they come. Thank you, Representative Heiner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, as a legislature, we, we not only have, are trying to uh, make things better for us to, today, 
for the immediate future, but we also have to look down the road as far as we can feasibly see. Our community colleges, are, some of them are seeing a declining uh, enrollment right now. So what's that, if we change this, what impact will that have not only today, but in the future? And with that declining enrollment, are we seeing more declining in the distant learning, or is that in class face-to-face? -face? Because we've got to look down the road a little bit and see, are we, is the demogra demographics of our community college changing? And we need to try and get in front of that. So uh, is it, how much impact will this have 10 or 20 years from now, as well as what it will impact right now? Thank you, Representative Penn. Thank you. Um, like the good representative from Lander said, I'm just trying to get make sure I can get my head around what we're dealing with here. Um, the other question I have or would pose is, is it the responsive, do we have a responsibility to um, make sure that all of the satellite lesion, le <laughs> satellite locations um, come up to par with the same level of equipment and those types of things as the home base? Or are the satellite lesions more of an uh, access point for some of the classes rather than potentially having the, uh, rather than having the potential to become full campuses, you know, all around the state. Thank you, Representative Brown. Thank you. Uh, so I, I was just brought up some inter interesting information that I think might be helpful uh, to the rest of the body to understand this process as well. So community colleges are funded in a very unique way, right? So we have the state aid portion, which is what we're talking about when we talk about the reimbursement. And that's, again, our, our good appropriators that like to make sure that they have the, the leash on what's, what's being spent across the state. But we also have the local um, amount of funding that comes in. But ultimately, at the end of the day, what you have is a finite pot of money that comes to these community colleges. And this finite amount of money is what they get to spend the money on to provide the courses. And so we're talking about creating a workforce. We wanna make sure we diversify our economy. We wanna make sure we have an educated workforce, but we're not willing or we're questioning whether or not we're willing to pay to educate that student in Wamsutter versus Rock Springs. And whether or not that student in Wamsutter is worth the 0.8 versus the 1.0 or the 1.5 if they want to do welding or they want to do nursing or we have a lab or something along those lines. That's ultimately what we're talking about. But that reimbursement portion that they're going to get off of this is going to be off that state aid, right? It's going to be that state aid that gets given back to the community colleges when they say, hey, look, we had this many kids take this many courses at a level one, level two, and level three. And then they're going to get that money back and it's going to help them assist them as they're trying to do this process. Now, let's keep in mind, let, let's take a, a step back here for, I don't know, about five, six years. Um, this is the first time that I have been at this microphone where we haven't been talking about cutting a program. Where over the past six years, we actually have money that we can take care of our community colleges, our schools, our state, whatever the case may be. So our community colleges have actually received cuts upon cuts upon cuts upon cuts, and they're not able to take care of the programs and the services that they're providing right now to the point that they're shutting down programs. What this bill is attempting to do is alleviate a little bit of the pressures that we're seeing by providing them with a, a level impact when they are teaching a course to a student, no matter where they're at, they're going to get that same reimbursement. Personally, I think this is a really smart idea. Politics aside, if you, if you want an educated workforce and you want a, a, a position where you're going to have uh, students want to go to course, have a course to go to, you have to provide some level of funding. Otherwise, these community colleges are going to start pulling back these distance education programs and they're not going to provide these opportunities for these kids that cannot travel from Wam Sutter to Rollins or to Rock Springs or wherever the nearest location is. So again, politics aside, what we're really talking about is if we do not change and we do not allow this bill to pass, is you're going to see a reduction in the services that are offered by your community colleges and the workforce that we're trying to develop in this, in this state. You're going to see a reduction in that workforce not being able to be educated to the standards that they want to be educated to. 
So just as I had a, 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 the good representative from the, the Snowy Range area, we have these community college outreach centers. That's where these places are gonna be taken care of. And if you're not familiar with yours, I would encourage you to go take a look at yours because they're gonna be in all of our communities. And I guarantee every single one of you represents at least one of them. Those may not be around if we don't pass this bill because if we don't pass this bill, they don't have the funding to continue to do this because they've cut their budget so severely over the past six years. So stand for any more questions, Mr. Chairman. Representative Harshman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think uh, this is pretty simple. We put this statute in place. I think I was actually in that role on appropriations. It's probably six, eight years ago, right? When we were first starting to kind of go down this road and experiment with online education in our community colleges. There's 41 community college campus sites across our state. Most of your communities have one. Uh, but we didn't really know the cost. So this has been six, eight years ago that this point eight was put in. We thought, surely it doesn't cost the same. You don't have brick and mortar. So what's happened in the last six years, eight years? World's changed dramatically. We really know now what it costs. And I think you heard from a couple higher education instructors. Um, and I know my experience as a secondary instructor, it's a, it's a pain. <laughs> it's way more work teaching online. And I think they've discovered that. And so this point eight, it's not going to cost $100 million. Indeterminable means that these enrollments change a lot and they can't tell you exactly $3 million it's going to cost. But it's going to be probably 2% more, <clears throat> maybe, you know, maybe a couple million bucks more a year. Uh, but again, I think, uh, that's a small part, I think, to keep this rolling. The world's changed, and it's gonna be more of a demand for this, and we wanna continue that and, and keep our workforce moving forward. So this is a little bill, it's a little fix that we've learned more, uh, and I'm gonna vote aye on it, and I encourage your aye vote. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Question being called. All those in favor of Representative um, Vice Chair Obermuller's motion that when the Committee of the Whole rises to report, it do so with a recommendation that bill number 29 do so pass. Please say aye. All those opposed, please say no. No. Division has been called. All those in favor, please rise. Please remain standing and stand still for the count. All those opposed, please stand. Uh, division has passed. House Bill 29 has passed the Committee of the Whole. 
Let's move on. The next bill for consideration is House Bill 16. The reading clerk will read the bill. House Bill 16, sponsored by Agriculture, State Land Leasing Improvements, an act relating to state lands. Mr. Speaker, your committee number five, Agriculture, State and Public Lands and Water Resources, to whom is referred House Bill 16, State Land Leasing Improvements, respectfully report same back to the House with the recommendation that it do pass with the following amendments. Eyes, Representatives Alamend, Allred, Banks, Conrad, Crago, Davis, Eklund, Slagle, Winter. Representative Eklund, Chairman. You have heard the reading of the bill. What is your pleasure? Mr. Representative Eklund. Mr. Chairman. I move that when the Committee of the Whole rises to report, it do so with a recommendation that House Bill 16 do pass. Uh, the bill has two amendments, and I would, would like to move those as well and dispense with them as, as I'll explain them briefly, but most of it can be explained in the management of the bill. I'd like to start by apologizing to the body because I don't think I properly, uh, with proper decorum, uh, introduce the last amendment. So I move uh, when the committee of the whole rises to report, it do so with the recommendation um, that a standing amendment one to House Bill 616 do pass. And um, I, this is a, a wordsmithing and um, partly wordsmithing, minor technical changes to your bill if you look at it. And then a better description the committee felt of what we were trying to do. And I would uh, ask for your support. Question, Question Question's been called on standing committee number one. Aye. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. Standing, standing um, committee number one passes. Um, back on the bill, um, Representative Slagle. Sorry, Representative Eklund. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And colleagues, we don't always do it this way. Sometimes these amendments will come as the bill is being presented. Uh, just depends on, on how we think it'll work best. The second amendment appears to be a more substantial one. Um, let, me, let me move the, the amendment properly if I can. And it's a, a standing or a uh, committee of the whole amendment number one to House Bill One. And I'll explain why we're doing this we weren't sure when we were in, in committee whether or not we could go to a whole different part of the statute and amend the bill. Um, it seemed like we had done it, but all of us are kind of shaking off the rust and the, and the dust to try to uh, remember how we did this. It's not a very natural process. This language that is here will be described in the bill um, just as it is here. This is a different part of statute in there. It just gets two parts of statute to conform with one another so that if the bill passes, um, we'll have conforming statute. And it was brought to our attention by the uh, state lands office. So with that, I'd like to turn over the floor management of the bill to one of our new members from House District 2, um, the beautiful prairies of, of southwestern Weston and Niobrara counties. Uh, Representative Schlegel. We may have to go backwards here. We have to have debate on committee of the whole amendment number one if there are if there is any debate. Representative Schlegel. You need to at least move committee of the whole amendment number one.
Mr. Chairman, Chairman, Eklund. Mr. Chairman, was that on bill, the first bill amendment, that we did? Amendment number one. Committee of the whole, amendment number one. Okay, I think I've moved both of these. Just ask me. Somebody. Speaker Summers. Mr. Chairman, thank you. So, Chairman Eklund, you're turning the explanation of the Committee of the Whole Amendment number one over to Representative Slagle to explain I'm as he sorry. moves through the bill. Is that what we're doing here? Did we vote on the second? We're, uh, nobody knows what the second right. Committee of the Whole Amendment is, I would guess. So I would say as, as the individual who's bringing this bill, as they move through that bill, they may want to explain how the Committee of the Whole Amendment number one, I'm right. asking that as a okay. member of this body. All right. I want to hear how the Committee of the Whole Amendment number one fits into this bill with an, within the explanation of the bill. Okay. Uh, the... Chairman Eklund. Mr. Chairman. So we, if I understand things correctly, we didn't vote on this second amendment, correct? Um, I thought we had. Not the committee of the whole. All right. So fit into this, uh, this bill, we inserted a, a second amendment that would help it to conform with other statutes. The first statute is in 365110, 365 and, and 365.111. Then you, you insert a larger amendment that's on page four that you won't see in your bill, but it is an amendment. Oh dear. It isn't. No, no, we still needed to do the First Amendment as it was. The Second Amendment fits into page four, line 15. Um, and we insert another part of statute that will then conform with the statute that we're trying to change now. Um, I think that explains what we're trying to do and I would like to move this I've moved the amendment. I would like to, to uh, for the body to consider it and pass it. If the bill passes, this other part of statute then will be changed as it needs to be because we've changed the, the first, uh, uh, the statute in the first place. Does that explain the question? Any further discussion? Sure. On the amendment, any further discussion on the amendment? A point of order, Mr. Chairman, we are on committee of the whole amendment number one at this point, which would detail the sale uh, of the parcel with the appurtenances already on it as part of the price to a new lessee. And maybe if somebody could explain that amendment just a bit more on the floor, like the nice gentleman next to me. Representative Crago. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So essentially what Committee of the Whole Amendment number one does is brings a conforming amendment that was requested by the Office of State Lands yesterday. The original bill, which uh, the good representative from the eastern part of the state is about to describe, essentially deals with leases and how a state land lessee is compensated for improvements they make to state land leases, property owned by the state of Wyoming. Um, if they happen to lose the lease or decide they no longer want it. Yesterday, uh, during committee, uh, the Office of State Lands informed us that we also needed to bring a conforming amendment so we had identical language in the provision of the law regarding state land sales. Otherwise, we would have had two different standards uh, regarding how a lessee is compensated for improvements they make on the land. And so, what the Committee of the Whole Amendment does is simply conforms the language. So whether you're 
losing a lease because the land you don't want the lease anymore or you're losing the lease because the property is being sold for another purpose, you are compensated exactly the same. That's all it does, conforming amendment, and we'll learn more about the bill in a, in a few minutes. I would ask for your I vote on the committee whole amendment number one. Thank you. Question being called. All those in favor of, of um, amendment number one, say aye. aye. All those opposed, say no. Committee of the whole, the amendment is adopted. Back to the bill. I, Mr. Chairman, Chairman, I Eklund. turn the, the floor management of the bill over to uh, my colleague from House District 2. Representative Slagle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, want, I would like to present House Bill 16 to you. As, as you looked at it, as was already mentioned, and as we discussed, or, and as we discussed in um, committee yesterday, basically what it does, it just changes the, the limit from 2,000 to 4,000 that a, a lessee of the state land can expend on state land without having to get uh, permission from this uh, <clears throat> board of state lands. And then, um, so that's the main change. Then on page um, three, line seven, <clears throat> there's a change in there. There's several changes where improvements is changed just to improvement. It's just a grammar, grammar change. There's several of those in there. <clears throat> Then as we went on, as the, the amendment we, we talked about earlier uh, is over on, comes in on page four, where on line two you see depreciated. And as we discussed that, uh, the committee didn't really feel depreciated value was what we wanted, and we changed that to current market value. And part of the reason for that is Current market value is already defined in Wyoming statute, so we have a definition for that. And then also in that amendment, um, we went down to um, new lessee on line four and crossed that out and put in applicant because new lessee actually wouldn't have been in charge of that lease at that point in time, they would still be an applicant. So that's why that change was made. And then going back, excuse me, but going back to the reason for the change in value, basically that was to accommodate for inflation because what happens is an example would be, we have a well on that state land and it went out, we need to replace it. Uh, $2,000 might not be enough to cost cover the cost of that. I mean, a uh, pump could easily cost $2,500 and then whatever it takes to install that. So the 4,000 was an inflation adjustment so we could take care of that. <clears throat> then as was mentioned, the second part of our <clears throat> amendment is to uh, take care of the language in um, 369105, where it's a different part of statute, and we just make that language the same, changing contributory to current market value, which is what was what we changed in our other amendment. Is I stand for questions now. Question being called. Question being called. All those in favor of Representative or Chairman Eklund's uh, motion that when the Committee of the Whole rises to report, it do so with the recommendation that Bill Number 16 do so pass. Please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. House Bill 16 has passed the Committee of the Whole. Mr. Chairman. 
uh, majority floor of the year. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There will be a couple of more bills that I'm going to give you guys numbers for that we're going to be going on to, so write these down. When, if and when we get done with number five, we will move on to bill number 39 and bill number 52. So just moving you forward on the agenda, and we'll see how things progress. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The next bill for consideration is House Bill 5. The reading clerk will read the bill. House Bill 5, sponsored by corporations. Voter registry list, voter ID, and absentee ballots. An act relating to education, or, or act relating to elections. Mr. Speaker, your committee number seven, corporations, elections, and political subdivisions, to whom is referred House Bill 5, voter registry list, voter ID, absentee ballots. Respectful report, same back to the House, with the recommendation that it do pass with the following amendments. Eyes, representatives Chadwick, Haroldson, Harshman, Knapp, Newsom, Olson, Ottman, Wiley, Yin. Representative Olson, Chairman. You have heard the reading of the bill. What is your pleasure, Representative Olson? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that when the committee the whole rises to report that it do so with the recommendation that House Bill Number 5 do pass. I further move the Standing Committee Amendment Number 1 to this bill. I will take up the Standing Committee Amendment later. I will turn to the explanation of the bill first from the good representative from House District 34, and then you can bounce back to me for the Standing Committee Amendment. Representative Ottman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, basically, a pretty easy bill. This bill was put out to basically make a, just a few changes which will be in the amendment. But what it's going to do is um, amend the definition of the registry list to include the voter identification numbers and absentee ballot requests and returns. So pretty much that's it, just to make those available and to codify that into statute. Representative Olson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will address the Standing Committee Amendment. It does two things. First, it's got some cleanup clarification language when, the, when absentee data appears in the bill. The original language was absentee ballot requests and returns. At the request of our clerks, they suggested that maybe it should say absentee ballot status. So that's the first thing the amendment does throughout um, the three pages of the bill. The second thing it does is goes to the registry list. Um, there's a list of data information that's discoverable upon a public records request for that registration uh, registry list. And what we are adding to the list is registration status. So knowing when um, an individual first registered to vote. And that is the standing committee amendment. With that, I would ask for your favorable consideration of that amendment. Questions, McCall, you have heard the motion on the Standing Committee men Amendment. Are you ready for a question? Question being called, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. Standing con uh, Committee Amendment 1 has been adopted. We are back on the bill. Question being called, all those in favor of Representative Olson's motion that when the Committee of the Whole rises to report it do so with the recommendation that House Bill Number 5 do pass, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. House Bill 5 has been passed the Committee of the Whole. Uh, we are on to believe House Bill number 39. Is that correct? The first bill, or the next bill for our consideration is House Bill 39. The reading uh, clerk will read the bill. House Bill 39, sponsored by Transportation, verifying the veteran designation on Wyoming driver's license, an act relating to motor vehicles. Mr. Speaker, your committee number eight, Transportation, Highways, and Military Affairs, to whom was referred House Bill 39, verifying the veteran designation on a Wyoming driver's license. Respectful report, same back to the House, with the recommendation that it do pass. Ayes. Representatives Berger, Brown, 
Nemec, Obermuller, O'Hearn, Pendergraf, Smith, Stivar, Wiley. Representative Brown, Chairman. You've heard the reading of the bill. What is your pleasure? Representative Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that when the Committee of the Whole rises to report it, do so with the recommendation that House Bill 39 do pass. And I further move the bill over to floor management for our good friend over in House District 60. Representative Nymek. Mr. Chairman, I bring you House Bill 39, uh, verifying the veteran designation on Wyoming driver's license. If you turn to page two of your bill on line three, what it does is removes the certification by the Wyoming Veterans Commission and goes to the Wyoming Department of Transportation for documentation issued by the Armed Forces of the United States, a DD-214. Uh, this removes, uh, reduces the bureaucracy in assisting veterans, uh, getting that veterans designation on their driver's license. And if you go down to uh, paragraph two, 317141, uh, it also adds in veteran instead of V on the Wyoming driver's license. Is there any further discussion on the bill? Question, Question being called. All those in favor of uh, Representative Brown's motion up. Oh, never hold on. Let me get to the right page. Question be called, all those in favor of Representative Brown's motion that when the Committee of the Whole rises to report it, do so with the recommendation that House Bill number 39 do pass. All that, uh, all, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. House Bill 39 is passed, the Committee of the Whole. Majority Floor Leader. Mr. Chairman, I move that the Committee of the Whole rise and report. You've heard the motion. All those in favor, aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries. The reading clerk will read the Committee of the Whole report. Mr. Speaker, your Committee of the Whole, having had under consideration bills on general file, begs leave to report as follows. House Bill 17, do pass amended. House Bill 29, do pass. House Bill 16, do pass amended. House Bill 5, do pass amended. House Bill 39, do pass. Representative Byron, Chairman. Your turn. I make a motion that we adopt. Byron, Representative Byron. I make a motion that we adopt the committee of the whole report. You have heard the motion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries. Congratulations, aye. Representative aye. Andrew. So with that, I think, uh, Mr. Majority Floor Leader, I think we'll recess. We're going to let committees do their work, come back. We'll see if there's any, I don't know if they'll have any bills we can read in. Two o'clock. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I move that the committee 
stand in recess until 2 p.m. The House will stand at recess until 2 p.m. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, motion, motion carries. You will stand in recess until 2. Do we have committee reports? Chairman, Vice Chairman Obermuller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, standing committee number four will meet in room three. And we'll consider two bills, House Bill 31, BOCES' local education agencies, and House Bill 33, school finance career technical education grants. Chairman Burkhart. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your committee number nine, Minerals, Business and Economic Development, will meet at 8.30 Monday, uh, whatever the date of Monday is, to consider one bill, House Bill 69, Coal-Fired Facility Closures Litigation Funding. We will not hear House Bill 40, Airport Districts. Thank you. Um, let me go to Chairman Washett. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your committee number one judiciary will meet on Monday, January 16th at 8 o'clock in our normal meeting room number one to hear two bills, House Bill 14, civil case filing fees, and House Bill 12, presumptive child support payments. Chairman Olson. Thank you. Your committee number seven corporations will be meeting now upon noon recess to hear two bills, HB3, State Assessment of Independent Power Producers, and HB 47, Election Equipment Federal Certification. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Vice Chair Obermuller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I forgot to mention, uh, my committee will meet in roughly 15 minutes. Grab some lunch first. Thank you. Chairman Nicholas. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Speaker. So your joint appropriations will meet at noon recess to continue its um, the round robin for the general operation of the government, which is LSO 407. Um, we will have the, re <clears throat> your house appropriations will do re-referrals for um, House Bill 50 and 61 at noon as well, just before we get started. And on Monday at noon, your house, your house appropriations will hear um, House Bill 24 and 46. Thank you. We'll stand in recess till 2 p.m. <laughs> 